Hello, hola, hello everybody. <laughs> hola. Um, Well, welcome to the first colloquium of spring 2020. And before our um, introducer and first speaker come up here, I have a couple of announcements to make. So please join us next week for the Cohen Lectures, next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They'll be delivered by Cecile Fromont, who will be speaking on objects of power, material and spiritual histories of the Afro-Atlantic. And our next colloquium will be um, delivered by, on uh, next Wednesday, will be delivered by Bakari Kitwana, our NAS fellow. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he'll be speaking on the rap sessions, Hip Hop or Presidential Elections Video Archive. Okay. Now, please welcome to the podium Professor Emmanuel Akiampong, Professor of African and African American Studies, as well as Director of the Center for African Studies. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Usman Uma Khan this afternoon at the Du Bois Fellows Colloquium. Uh, good friend, wonderful scholar. In 2012, Professor Khan was appointed as the first Awa Lead Bin Talil Professor of Contemporary Islamic Religion and Society at Harvard University's Divinity School. He is also a professor in the Department of African and African American Studies and serves as denominational counselor to Muslim students at Harvard. Professor Khan attended the Université de la Sorbonne Nouvelle, where he received his Bachelor of Arts degrees in both classical Arabic and colloquial Arabic. Later, he earned an MA in translation and documentation from the Sorbonne. Then he was awarded a PhD in political science at the Institut d'Etudes Politiques de Paris with a specialization in comparative politics of Sub-Saharan Africa. Following fellowships at the University of London, Yale University, and Columbia University, and the Institute for Advanced Study at Berlin, Professor Khan was appointed as an Associate Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University in 2002, where he remained before coming to Harvard. In addition to Islamic studies and comparative and Islamic politics, Professor Khan's research includes the phenomenon of Muslim globalization. His book, Homeland is the Arena, Religion, Transnationalism, and the Integration of Senegalese Immigrants in America, uh, which came out in 2011, examines the importance of religious organizations among immigrant communities in New York. His most recent work is Beyond Timbuktu, an intellectual history of Muslim West Africa, published by Harvard University Press in 2016. The recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, Professor Khan has received grants from the Rockefeller Foundation, from the Endowment of the United States Institute of Peace, and support from the Muslims in New York Project. In 2015, the Graduate Student Council of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, awarded him the Everett Mendelssohn Prize for Excellence in Mentoring. Please welcome Professor Usman Khan as he delivers his lecture on the transformation of the pilgrimage tradition in Western Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, my brother Emmanuel. Thank you, Professor Gates, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, speak in this colloquium. I have been here for eight years looking for this opportunity, and I'm so glad that uh, now this is coming true. So the title 
of the lecture is the transformation of the pilgrimage tradition in West Africa. There is a large consensus in Islamic historiography that the greater pilgrimage to Mecca or the Hajj was institutionalized in the ninth year of the Islamic calendar. The performance of the ritual takes place annually in the first half of the Muslim month of the Al-Hijjah, culminating in the station at Mount Arafat <coughs> on the 10th day of that month. Since the eighth year of the Islamic calendar, Muslims from all over the world have headed annually to the Holy Lands to fulfill this religious obligation, which is incumbent on all Muslims who can afford it. The Hajj is the opportunity for the atonement of all past sins. It is unique among the great religious pilgrimages for its doctrinal centrality, its geographic focus, its historical continuity, and its size and global coverage. Alongside and often associated with the Hajj is the tradition of ziyara, or pious visitation in special mosques or mausoleums of Muslim holy people. The most important such mausoleums for Muslims is that of the Prophet Muhammad, which is located in Medina, about 400 kilometers from Mecca. Although not part of the ritual of the greater pilgrimage, the trip to Medina is made by pilgrims performing the Hajj. Uh, and in addition, pilgrims also visit um, mausoleums of uh, Muslim martyrs and some historical sites of great significance for uh, the Muslim community, including um, in places like uh, Jerusalem or Hebron, where I was just uh, you know, a few weeks ago. Hebron, where uh, the mausoleum of uh, Abraham, Muslim beliefs, uh, is uh, located. Visitation then takes also place in mausoleums of Shiite Imam, of Sufi Sheikh, etc. And for the long time, the pilgrimage was linked to the tradition of study, as most pilgrims were scholars who spent time in centers of learning along the way to and in the holy lands to study, to acquire books, and to seek uh, scholarly credentials. And like elsewhere in the Muslim world, religious travel in West Africa was motivated by uh, those very three reasons. The first being to perform the pilgrimage to the Holy Land. The second, to visit the shrines of holy Islamic figures. And last but not least, the third type of travel which could be combined with any of the first two is the search for uh, esoteric or exoteric knowledge, which is typically sanctioned by the award of an authorization to transmit that knowledge, which is uh, called uh, Ijaza in Arabic. In the 20th century, a combination of factors contributed to transform the nature and participation to the pilgrimage in West Africa, in the Holy Lands, and for that matter, globally. Technological progress and geopolitical change uh, played an important role in this transformation. Before the 20th century, pilgrims traveled by foot or on camelback from West Africa to the Holy Lands. The trip lasted a minimum of two years each way, and a round trip lasting 10 years was not uncommon. The journey from Mecca to Medina took a minimum of one week. The travel by camel of the distance of 100 kilometers separating Mecca from Jeddah where uh, pilgrims traveling on board landed, that travel lasted two days. Now West African pilgrims, and indeed the majority of pilgrims from the 168 countries participating in the Hajj can fly the same day from their country to the Holy Land, and comfortable and affordable buses cover the distance from Mecca to Medina in uh, a couple of hours, and from Jeddah to Mecca in one hour. For centuries prior to the rise of nation states, many pilgrims traveled without identification or vaccination against the deadly diseases that decimated them. 
in the course of the 20th century, several international agreements between Saudi Arabia and countries sending pilgrims ensured the acquisition of adequate documentation and vaccination prior to traveling to the Holy Lands. This considerably reduced the disappearance and death toll due to disease. Before the 20th century, travel within Saudi Arabia was unsafe as was Trans-Saharan travels. Bedouins routinely looted pilgrim caravans. In the 20th century, with the consolidation of the Saudi state, the insecurity was eradicated and pilgrims traveled safely from one part to the other of the Holy Lands. Until the mid 20th century, the holy mosques of Mecca and Medina could host only a few thousand worshippers. In the last uh, few decades, tens of billions of dollars have been invested by Saudi Arabia to considerably expand the hosting infrastructures of these sites. And in West Africa, most of the funding for pilgrimage was raised locally until the 1960s. At the turn of the 21st century, a sizable West African diaspora settled in the West, and this diaspora, this Muslim diaspora, opened new routes by investing abundant material resources in maintaining and creating ties between their homelands, center of pilgrimage, the Muslim Holy Land, North Africa, uh, <coughs> and their uh, Western host countries. Until the mid 20th century, West African pilgrims to Mecca were mostly male. Now, females are equal to their male counterparts, and some years they even outnumber them by a significant margin. Up until recently, the travel of pilgrims culminated in the Holy Lands. Now, in one trip, many pilgrims can perform pilgrimage in holy sites in North Africa on their way to or from Mecca, and they can include global cities such as Dubai, Shanghai, and Beijing to their trip. Last but not least, the overwhelming majority of West African pilgrims were motivated by the search for knowledge and scholarly credentials prior to the 20th century. <coughs> now this peripatetic tradition has completely disappeared due partly to the rise of nation states with an effective control of their borders. States Arab states of North Africa and the Gulf do give student visa and scholarships to support studies of Muslims from all over the world now, as they also uh, give tourist visa for pilgrims, but these are two completely different processes involving different categories of people. Prior to the 20th century, the pilgrimage was the main source of supply of scholarly works and student pilgrims would buy or beg for manuscripts or spend time to copy them. Their bags would be full of books when they returned home. Now many of those books are available for free download from some Islamic websites and can be accessed anywhere in the world or purchased in bookstores of any country in the world. Books no longer figure prominently among items brought back by pilgrims. Instead, the pilgrimage has uh, <clears throat> been the main source of supply of video clips on the Holy Lands, and all pilgrims have smartphones to capture video clips at each moment of the pilgrimage, and they share these uh, clips via WhatsApp with friends from all over the world. They also bring huge bottles of water from the well of Zamzam, that miraculous uh, well which is offered gracious, graciously in the Holy Land. 3.7 million gallons were offered in 2018, as well as uh, clothes also in fashion that, they, that pilgrims brought, bring back to their home. In fact, the widespread popularity of Arab clothing in many areas of West Africa is linked directly to the explosion in number of pilgrims from the region. As more and more people travel to pilgrimage sites in uh, Mecca in Medina, but also in North Africa. And as China became involved in producing these uh, clothes at more affordable price, they became increasingly popular in West Africa, whether those who wear them have gone on pilgrimage or not. 
So now, in what follows, I will discuss the pilgrimage tradition to the Holy Land and North Africa and how it was transformed. I will analyze the emergence of new sites of pilgrimage in West Africa itself that parallel in scope uh, the pilgrimage of the Holy Land. I will also discuss the role that the West African diaspora played in connecting different uh, you know, sites, their host country, Holy Land, North Africa, and, and in Saudi Arabia. And I will show how the Hajj has become divorced from intellectual pursuits and linked to trade and tourism. And I will conclude that West Africa now hosts some of the largest religious gatherings in the world. And by exploring this transformation, I hope to illustrate the connections between the rise of the nation state in the Muslim world, globalization, the transformation of material culture and intellectual history. Now from food and camel back to air travel, the transformation of the West African pilgrimage to Mecca. African Muslims have been <coughs> uh, performing the pilgrimage to Mecca for centuries, but the history of the pilgrimage of the Hajj before the 19th century is poorly documented. The majority of the sources are unpublished travelogues. Learned pilgrims wrote travel narratives, but these exist in manuscript form and were never published due to the non-existence of the printing technology in West Africa uh, before European colonialism. The most solid evidence prior to the 20th century concerns royal pilgrimage. By the 11th century, a few West African kings had converted to Islam, and the earliest recorded uh, royal conversion to Islam is that of uh, Warjabi, the king of Takrur. <coughs> so you see Takrur is here in northern Senegal, um, and its king was the first uh, known you know, ruler to convert to Islam in West Africa. Uh, so <coughs> it was in 1040 that Warjabi converted to Islam and his people along with him. It was followed by the conversion of the king of uh, Saifawa, ruler of the kingdom of Kanemburno. So this is the, uh, what, what Kanemburno in the, around 1200. And mention of Takruri or Barnawi in reference to Takrur and Borno in Arab writings suggests that pilgrims from these regions were well known in the Holy Land in the 13th century. And several other kings uh, converted subsequently and many of them performed the pilgrimage to Mecca. And renowned Arab and African authors have written on the royal African pilgrimage including Al-Umari, the Arab author Al-Umari who died in 1349 in his book entitled Pathway of Visions in the Realms of Metropolises, Masalik al-Absar wa Mamalik al-Amsar in Arabic. And Ibn Khaldun, of course, that we know, uh, in his Prolegomena or Kitab al-Ibar, and al-Makrizi in his uh, work entitled Muldid Gold on those kings who made the pilgrimage, al-Dhahab al-Masbuk fi dhikr man hajja min al-Muluk in Arabic, a chapter of which deals with the king of Takrur. Ibn Battuta also mentioned this in his Rihla. So do the famous Timbuktu Chronicles. Two such royal pilgrimages have been abundantly chronicled. The first is that of the Mali Emperor Mansa Musa, and I'm sure you have uh, all heard of it. And this is a map which was drawn by Abraham Kress, one uh, uh, European cartographer in the 14th century after the, the, the famous pilgrimage of uh, Mansa Musa, and you see him here uh, holding uh, you know, uh, a, a gold nugget of gold, and uh, this was uh, <coughs> a very much, uh, uh, this is one of the most specular pilgrimages in history, if not the most. You know, he distributed so much gold that his passage was recorded in great detail by Egyptian and historians and, and, and others. I think according to the estimates of uh, Michael Gomez in his book, uh, African, Go African Dominion, it, there were 17,000, and sorry for, for the French, so 17, 17 ton of gold, you know, approximately. So he also brought books of Maliki jurisprudence and attractive scholars to, uh, from the Arab world to his kingdom, so you can see that, you know, scholarship and the growth of scholarship in uh, West Africa was, was closely linked to the pilgrimage, the royal pilgrimage, but also the pilgrimage of scholars who would go to Mecca often 
to learn, to study, to acquire credentials, then go back home with books. And, um, so Kanem Borno has also a long history of royal pilgrimage. And according to the Diwan of the Sultans of Borno, written by Idris Aloma, 20 kings of the Saifawa dynasty, dynasty who ruled Kanem Borno from the 11th to the 19th century, 20 kings of Kanem Borno performed the pilgrimage. Another pilgrimage worthy of note is that of Askia Muhammad the, of Songhai in 1497, where you know, he met in Cairo the uh, Abbasid Caliph who appointed him as the Caliph of, uh, uh, you know, of the Bilad Sudan, which means the land uh, of the black people referring to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, there were uh, two main pilgrimage routes from West Africa. Both of them were also trading routes. The first, you know, through uh, Mali, Niger, Northeastern Nigeria, Chad, Sudan, and through the Red Sea to the Arabian Peninsula. And another one through Mauritania, Morocco, and ultimately uh, Egypt, which offered the possibility of spending time in prestigious centers of learning in North Africa, such as uh, Fez, Tlemcen, Tunis, Kerouan, and Cairo. Unlike North African states, which provided care and assistance to, uh, to pilgrims, including you know, a regular dispatching of gifts, organizing an, institutional, an institutionalized caravan led by a, a, uh, an Amir al-Hajj, or you know, kind of minister of Hajj, there was no institutionalized pilgrimage in pre-colonial West Africa. But West African pilgrims would join the caravans departing from North Africa to the Hajj. Aside from the recorded royal pilgrimage, we know very little about the pilgrimage tradition before the 19th century. At the turn of the 20th century, another drive toward Mecca uh, took place, and it is called the Hijra Doctrine, or <coughs> the Doctrine of Immigration. And this movement was prompted by the colonial expansion of uh, the late 19th century. Europeans who had settled in West Africa in the coast since the 16th century conquered it at the turn of the 20th century, you know, very rapidly. Uh, and many Muslims who did not want to live under uh, non-Muslim rule, they fled to the Holy Land and they did the, the hijra or the, the, the immigration. The learned among these Muslims played an important role in the consolidation of the rule of King Abd, uh, Abdul Aziz bin Saud, the, fund, the founder of the, of the uh, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, in the field of teaching, preaching, both inside and uh, outside uh, Saudi Arabia. So the notion that Wahhabism was uh, you know, received by Africans, and they were passive recipients of Wahhabism, which came you know, after the <coughs> after the oil uh, boom, I think it needs to be nuanced because they were African scholars, very prominent among them in Mecca at the beginning of the 20th century and who helped the king of uh, Saudi Arabia to, uh, in, in the field of preaching and education. So they were very much involved in the spread of Wahhabi doctrine, not just in Saudi Arabia, but also outside. And this has been uh, very well uh, documented by the work of Shafi Ahmed. So although the pilgrimage is of utmost ritual importance for Muslims, only a small number of West African Muslims, and for that matter of all Muslims, performed the pilgrimage prior to the mid-20th century. Until the mid-1950s, the total number of pilgrims rarely exceeded 100,000. <coughs> so, at the beginning of the 21st century, the number of pilgrims exceeded 2 million, reaching 3.1 million in 2012. So this is still a tiny percentage of the Muslim global population, now approaching 1.8 billion, but the number grew by a factor of 30 in just a few decades. So given the huge logistical challenge of hosting so many people in pilgrimage sites, the Saudi state upon the recommendation of the Organization of the Islamic Conference dated uh, in 1987, fixed the, a quota of pilgrims at 1,000 pilgrims per 1 million of the population of states sending pilgrims. One of the conditions of the pilgrimage is that candidate must afford to perform the pilgrimage. But even those who could afford it were dissuaded because the trip entailed many risks, especially in security in the region traversed by pilgrims and also disease. 
For several centuries, the Sharifians were custodians of the two holy mosques of Mecca and Medina. To reach the holy mosques, pilgrims had to travel through territories governed by tribal leaders who considered themselves as absolute lords of their territories and exacted duties upon goods carried out through their dominions. To ensure the safety of pilgrims, duties were paid to the leaders of those tribes. Those duties were a budgeted part of the Ottoman uh, government's Hajj expense when you know, uh, <coughs> the Holy Lands were under uh, Ottoman rule. So its distribution, however, was all but transparent. The local government official in charge of the supervision of the pilgrimage or Amir al-Hajj and the caravan commanders routinely withheld some of the monies destined to tribal leaders. They made generous payments to the most powerful and aggressive tribes and very little or nothing to weak tribes. In this context, tribes asserted their own terrifying credibility vis-a-vis -vis the government to maintain their position versus others versus other rivals as the Hajj protector. Attacks against caravans were commonplace. Very often, uh, pilgrims were looted and sometimes killed by the Bedouins. For this reason, uh, the majority of pilgrims traveled in large groups and were armed to defend themselves if needed. Thus, uh, many, were, uh, many people from West Africa were dissuaded in traveling uh, in, in for several centuries, uh, dissuaded from traveling because of the insecurity. Disease was, were also a major issue. Pandemics like cholera decimated pilgrims. In 1865, 15,000 of 90,000 pilgrims, that is one-fifth, died in Mecca in 1865. And in addition to these risks shared equally by all pilgrims, West Africans were exposed to another risk, kidnapping and enslavement. Given the old racial prejudice against black people in the region, the kidnapping and, enslave, and enslaving of black people was commonplace, taking place not just in the way to the holy cities, but also in Mecca and Medina themselves up until you know, the, the 20th century. Among the members of the African diaspora in the area, quite a few are descendants of enslaved African pilgrims. Now, several developments in the early 20th century changed the situation to enable West African to travel. The first was European colonial rule, not that I am um, you know, praising European colonial rule, but it reduced considerably, uh, uh, it, 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 it limited considerably the geographic mobility of colonial subjects, that we know. All candidates had to seek a travel permit from the colonial bureaucracy, and colonial masters sponsored pilgrimage most of the time for their loyal subjects who traveled by boat to the Holy Land. The second development was the subjugation of the Holy Mosque sorry, by the dynasty of Al Saud, and they established their authority on the entire peninsula and were able to significantly improve the security situation. After World War II, dozens of Muslim majority countries became independent from European colonial rule. Taking the pilgrimage very seriously, they created an official body in charge of the organization of the pilgrimage, staffed by learned scholars and a medical team, this body takes care of all the needs of pilgrims from visa to vaccination to, to escorting them throughout the trip until the ret return home and teaching them how to perform the ritual of the pilgrimage. Finally, a series of conference contributed to improve the overall conditions of the pilgrimage, including uh, the Conference of Paris in 1930 in which sending countries signed agreements that contributed significantly to improve the conditions. And at that time, by the way, West Africa was under European colonial rule and the colonial state you know, was uh, organizing the pilgrimage. So all sending countries would ensure that candidates for pilgrimage would be vaccinated against uh, you know, disease, they, that all sending countries would deliver proper pilgrimage ID with a picture to candidates after establishing that they possess a round trip ticket to the pilgrimage. Sending country would, countries would pay all duties due to countries in which pilgrims transited no later than three months after the pilgrimage, and finally, all travelers possessing a passport and going to the Hijaz or uh, the Arabian Peninsula during the period of the pilgrimage would be treated decently as pilgrims whose security would be assured by the political authorities of the Hijaz. In addition, travel agents now typically supply their pilgrims several forms of identification, 
uh, including <coughs> an ID with their visa number and the address of their residence in Mecca in Medina, a scarf with the name of their travel agents, and finally bracelets with inserted tracking devices similar to those of prisoners which allow the travel agents to locate them in the Holy Land in case they uh, are ever separated from the group. At the turn of the 20th century, new development contributed to transform the pilgrimage even further. The oil wealth, which I already mentioned, provided huge resources to Saudi Arabia. Hundreds of billions of dollars were invested in the pilgrimage industry. Since 1950, uh, $100 billion was uh, uh, invested in uh, the expansion of the Mosque of Mecca, and by 2017, it became the largest mosque in the world capable of hosting 1.5 million worshippers, and it's now being further expanded to host a total of 2.2 uh, million uh, pilgrims. Before the expansion of the mosque, all rituals were performed at the ground level, and let me illustrate this with, uh, with this video. can see that rituals can be performed at, at three levels. Here, the ground level, here, the first floor, and the, the second floor. So which means that, you know, soon 2.2 million people will be able to perform at the same time the rituals of the pilgrimage. Whereas before the mid uh, 15th century, no more than 100,000, you know, people were, uh, you, you know, were, were there and not, and the Mosque would not even host 100,000, now 2.2 million. And the same thing happened in also in, in Medina. So l let me now show you uh, in, uh, in Minna where, you know, people, uh, you know, wh where the, the <coughs> wh wh where, you know, the Hajj culminate, you know, uh, where people spend the day in the Mount of Arafat. In the 1980s, when I first performed the pilgrimage, it was in a desert and all pilgrims, you know, built a tent with very poor material which they dismantled uh, <coughs> at the end of the day. Now look, look how it has been transformed now. Now there are 45,000 permanent tents in concrete which have been established with air conditioning, towel, toilets, showers, and so, so 45,000 it's organized, you know, according to nationality. So now this is how it has been uh, uh, transformed. <coughs> Okay, and uh, in the city of Medina, it's also the same. So this is the city of Medina where the uh, mausoleum of the Prophet is located. So this is Jannatul Baqiya, a cemetery, you know, where all Muslim martyrs and uh, early figures were, were, uh, uh, were are buried. So you could see what it was in 1890. This is another 
uh, another picture of the holy city of Medina, 1896. But now uh, there are hundreds of, uh, you know, uh, hotels, you know, uh, which th that have been that have been uh, um, built there to host visitors. So this is the mosque of Medina now. In uh, it's as almost as big as the mosque of Mecca, where, where, where you know where the Kaaba is. Can host also, you know, at several levels and allow, you know, a couple of million pilgrims to, to perform the pilgrimage. Now I want to address a second uh, site of pilgrimage in addition to, uh, to the Hajj, which is the Tijaniya site of pilgrimage in, in North Africa. So the Tijaniya uh, takes its name from its founder, Ahmed bin Mukhtar. Tijani, who was born in 1739 in, in sorry, in, in, in Aydumadi in Algeria, where he received most of his education. And uh, he uh, developed a great interest in Sufism, Tasawwuf, and studied with major Sufi Sheikh of 18th century Morocco. And in his youth, he was initiated in several Sufi orders, uh, including the Wazania, the Nasiriya, the Shadiliya, the Khalwatiya, and he traveled widely in North Africa and Asia to perform the pilgrimage, to seek knowledge, and to connect with major Sufi teachers. And in the 1780s, in exactly 1784, he um, claimed to have seen the Prophet not in dream but in reality while performing a spiritual retreat in Algeria. And the Prophet informed him that he is the seal of all saints and instructed him to create his own Sufi order of the Tijaniya, which he did. And in the following decade, uh, uh, the, tariq, the Sufi order of the Tijaniya spread in Algeria. So due to persecution from Ottoman authorities who ruled then Algeria, Ahmed Tijan left his natal town of Ainumadi, Algeria, to settle in Fez. And he was welcomed there by the ruling Sultan Moulay Suleiman of Morocco, who offered him a house in Fez which still attracts pilgrims. In addition, the Sultan invited him to join the Council of Scholars and, and, uh, and at his death he was buried in the Zawiya or the Sufi Lodge which he uh, built in Fez and that has become a site of, a major site of pilgrimage. In the course of the 19th and 20th century, the Tijaniya spread to become a major articulation of global Islam. It's following in the world runs in the tens of million, and at least 90% of them are from sub-Saharan Africa and its diaspora. So Tijani followers in West Africa have made a huge contribution to its development. They have built schools, uh, Sufi lodges, and initiated tens of millions of people in Africa. But it's not just in number that sub-Saharan -Af Africans dominate the Tijania. It is also in intellectual production and some of the major doctrinal elaboration of the Tijaniya was the work of West African uh, Tijani. Now, uh, Tijanis on both shores of the Sahara have endeavored to maintain close ties through uh, epistolary, exchange, epistolary exchanges, through letters, through poems, praising each other, and of course through pilgrimage from West Africa to uh, Tijani holy sites. <coughs> The pilgrimage from West Africa to Fez in Morocco is as old as the Tijani itself. It has waxed and waned, uh, involved many categories of people with various motivations, but has remained a link between Tijani of North and West Africa uh, for almost 200 years. In the 19th and first half of the 20th century, it was mostly scholars who performed the, the pilgrimage to Fez. The first is the Mauritanian scholar, uh, Muhammad al Hafid, who died in 1830 and who was initiated into the Tijaniya by Ahmed Tijani himself. And most Senegambian chains of transmission of the Tijaniya are traced to Muhammad al Hafid. Through the 19th century, it was mainly the religious elites who performed the pilgrimage to Fez. <coughs> uh, and the pilgrimage was for them, especially those from West Africa, a means to seek blessing at the shrine of the founder of the Tijaniya and the opportunity to accumulate prestigious uh, chains of transmission or ijazad in Arabic that link them directly to the establishment, Tijani establishment in Fez. After the consolidation of French colonial rule, 
Tijani leaders, some of whom were involved in anti-colonial activities, renounced armed resistance and pledged loyalty to the French with whom they collaborated for the duration of most of colonial rule. In the process of consolidation of their rule, uh, the French found it beneficial to cooperate with the Muslim scholars and particularly the Tijani communities. Because they were literate in Arabic, Muslim leaders served in the colonial bureaucracy as teachers, as interpreters, as judges in the Muslim tribunals. They engaged in the colonial economy by cultivating cash crops, which the French encouraged. They urged their followers to abide by colonial laws, to pay taxes to the French, uh, <clears throat> and to be loyal to the colonial state. But as proven by surveillance files on most Tijani leaders, the French never trusted them entirely because one of their greatest fear, you know, was pan-Islamism. That is a large coalition, a large and transnational coalition of African Muslims against colonial rule. To exercise that fear, they restricted the movement of colonial subjects between North and West Africa, and the French monitored the movement of African pilgrims uh, to North Africa uh, of West African pilgrims to North Africa and the Hijaz clo uh, closely. But nevertheless, among those Muslims allowed by the French colonial government to perform the pilgrimage, Tijani figured uh, prominently. And uh, toward the end of colonial rule, the restriction of travel between North and West Africa were lifted. And by the time of independence, pilgrims no longer needed the permission of the colonial authorities to travel between these two regions. In addition, post-colonial states of North and West Africa endeavored to strengthen their cooperation, and Morocco maintained diplomatic relations with uh, African governments, but it also maintained parallel diplomacy with Sufi leaders and particularly prominent uh, Tijani, Tijani Sheikh, who were given all sorts of favors by the Moroccan, uh, by the Moroccan monarchy. Uh, and Consequently, since uh, independence, thousands of West Africans have studied in Morocco. And uh, also in the 60s, uh, the, the, there were the first full packages for the pilgrimage from West Africa to Fez. And uh, it was uh, the French boat named Ancerville, which was built by the Chantier de l'Atlantique in Saint-Nazaire and inaugurated in 1962, which transported regular charter trips of Tijani from uh, Dakar to, uh, to Casablanca. And the trip was shorter, considerably shorter than the journey by camel, lasting only six days each way. And at this period, pilgrimage and trade went hand in hand. Many pilgrims seized the opportunity of the pilgrimage to purchase goods in Morocco, destined to uh, be resold back home. The cost of the trip was relatively affordable and there was no weight limitation for the pilgrims. Pilgrim merchants could bring as many commodities as they wanted. In 1973, the French boat en Serville was sold to the Chinese. In the 70s, the boat service tended to be replaced by air travel. Not only was the airfare higher than the boat fare, but airlines gave passengers a limited luggage allowance and charged a high fee for excess luggage. This caused the number of travelers to drop significantly from the mid 70s through the 90s. During this period, most pilgrims traveled individually or as a part of small groups led by a sheikh. At the beginning of the 21st century, the rise of the tourism industry in West Africa revived the full package options, and several companies proposed affordable full package uh, from West Africa to, uh, to, 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 to Morocco. And the Moroccan airline, Royal Air Maroc, operate two uh, days daily flights to, uh, to Morocco, to Casablanca from Dakar, and all these flights include significant number of pilgrims to Fez. In addition, some tour operators offer package combining visits of Tijania sites and tourism in major destinations uh, for tourists in Morocco, such as Casablanca, Rabat, Marrakesh. In Rabat, frequently uh, visited uh, sites, frequently visited sites include the Tour Hassan, the mausoleum of King uh, Mohammed V and ha King Hassan II, but also the shrine of uh, Tijani Sheikh, such as Arabi bin Sayyah. And uh, in the old city of Marrakesh, founded by the Al Muhad dynasty, are also found the shrines of prominent uh, Tijani Sheikh. 
search as Ahmed Skirij, Yashi, or Sidi Muhammad Kansusi. Most organized trip, uh, most organized group visits take place during the major Tijani and Muslim festivals. Among them are the religious uh, celebration of uh, the night, you know, of uh, when Shah Ahmed Tijani had the revelation from the Prophet, you know, asking him to create his own uh, tariqah called uh, uh, Laylat al Khatmiya. And also during the month of Ramadan, there are also many people who uh, travel uh, to Fez during the month of Ramadan. Now I want to go a little bit fast and address what important an important aspect of this transformation, which is the rise of West African pilgrimage sites. In West Africa itself, several sites of religious pilgrimage are drawing, are drawing crowds from all over the world, and some of these uh, religious gatherings parallel in scope, you know, the great Muslim pilgrimage. The, large, the largest such gatherings happen during the month of the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, known as, you know, the Mawlid, and there is consensus that the Prophet was born in the month of Rabi al-Awwal, which is the third month of the Muslim calendar, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people would head to major religious uh, cities in order to celebrate uh, the event. And the celebration starts from the beginning of the month of Rabi al-Awwal and lasts uh, almost uh, two weeks. In religious cities in Senegal like Tivawan or Medina Kaulak, thousands of people would meet every night from the beginning to recite poems in praise of, of the Prophet and especially the poem named Mantel or uh, Burda composed by Sharaf Din al-Busiri and uh, in the last few years, the celebration of the Mawlid has also included organizing academic conference in which prominent scholars would address issues of concern for Muslims in the world, uh, development, diplomacy, Sufism as a solution to problems of Muslim, especially in the September 11th, uh, in the aftermath of September 11th, when Islam has been associated with terrorism, many such Mawlid uh, lectures tend to highlight the role of Sufism in fostering peace as opposed to Wahhabism or Salafism, which they charge as nurturing uh, terrorism and violence. Now, uh, some major, you know, uh, Muslim pilgrimage include the Magal of Tuba, celebrated by the Murids. Uh, you know, uh, Murid is a movement founded by Ahmad Bamba, a Senegalese scholar who died in 1927. And, uh, and every year about three million people are, you know, associated in the, in the celebration of the Mawlid. But the Tijaniya also has uh, organized larger celebration, you know, that are uh, parallel to the, to the, to the, um, to the Magal and even to the Hajj. And, and I will just want to show you uh, a short video of the quality. <laughs> The, the, the video is not very good, but this is a celebration of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the birthday of Sheikh Ibrahim Nyas, a Senegalese uh, scholar who died in 1975. And this was in Gombe, Nigeria. And it was estimated the number of people who participated, you know, were more than 3 million. That is more, more than the Hajj. The, the video is not yes. <laughs> وصل الشيخ إلى مكانه الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين هذا هو الشيخ إبراهيم 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 so you can, you can see that, you know, in West Africa now, there are religious celebrations that bring as many people, if not more people, than the Hajj itself. Largest celebrations, secular or religious, in the world are now taking place in West Africa. And this is one example. The Magal of Tuba is, is another example. And now to conclude, I have analyzed the transformation of the tradition of Muslim pilgrimage in West Africa and argued that West African Muslims have been performing the pilgrimage to Mecca for a millennium and the spread of Sufi orders from the Maghreb and especially the Tijaniyas created 
new pilgrimage sites in North Africa. And prior to the 20th century, the trip was long and unsafe. Many would never return home. The majority of pilgrims were students in search of knowledge and scholarly credentials. They spent time along the way or in the pilgrimage sites to study. And this is not just true for West Africa, but also for other regions uh, of the world, including South Asia, where it has been proven that madrasa networks were engined behind um, you know, Islamic uh, global cosmopolitanism, as uh, Brandon Ingram would say, because they compelled students to travel across continents long before the, area, the era of, uh, of, of, of globalization. When West Africa fell under European colonial rule in the 20th century, restrictions were imposed on the travel of citizens by the colonial state, which closely monitored the pilgrimage. It determined quotas of Africans allowed to go to the Hajj. Only uh, loyal colonial subjects were permitted to travel in the colonially sponsored pilgrimage. But the trip was shorter. The round trip travel to uh, Mecca lasted between you know, three or six months because pilgrims would sojourn in centers of learning in North Africa and in Egypt in their way to the Holy Land to study. During colonial rule, some pilgrims traveled at great risk by foot or camel without the permission of the colonial state. Little is known about their uh, pilgrimage about, beside travel narratives. In the late uh, 20th century, the nature and participation to the pilgrimage and conditions of pilgrimage were radically transformed. And I have explained uh, that, right? That the Saudi state invested a lot of money to expand hosting infrastructures and to ensure pilgrimage safety. The number of pilgrims multiplied exponentially, and technological development has made now air travel virtually the only means of travel either to North Africa or the Holy Land. And many pilgrims are able to visit sites in North Africa and Saudi Arabia in a few days. And this shift in pilgrimage have con uh, these shifts in pilgrimage have contributed to fragment the pilgrimage tradition and eliminate the itinerant scholarly tradition. Previously, scholars and students would visit many of the holy sites along the way to and from the Holy Land. But now they can simply skip most of these sites by traveling by plane. Consequently, the more regional pilgrimages have become separated from the Hajj tradition. And however, pilgrims include many students who go to Morocco, Algeria, Saudi Arabia for studies, and they take advantage of their positions of being there to make pilgrimage. Whereas before, scholars took advantage of the Hajj to pursue studies. Now students take advantage of the international studies there to pursue pilgrimage. West African pilgrims now are, you know, sometimes, as I said, outnumber men. And uh, uh, pilgrims also include uh, many, 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 many people. So. To conclude, as a central pillar of Islam, the Hajj is one of the most well-known and popular Muslim uh, pilgrimage tradition, or even the most popular pilgrimage tradition in the world. It is easily recognized and familiar to Muslims and non-Muslims. West African participation in this massive global tradition is as old in the region as Islam itself, and it has constituted a central future in the development and flourishing of Islam in West Africa. It has also historically been linked to other important sites, other important sites and traditions of pilgrimage from the Atlantic coast to the Holy Land in present day Saudi Arabia. Modern geopolitical, technological, and economic changes have quite revolutionized practically every aspect of this tradition, and these dramatic shifts in one of the most important rituals has not been adequately studied, I would say. As more people and different types of people engage in pilgrimage, the nature and purpose of the pilgrimage, the physical conditions of pilgrimage, and many other factors have changed dramatically. So, so has its effect on the practice of Islam and especially on Islamic erudition in West Africa. This paper is uh, part of a larger uh, project. This presentation is part of a larger project, you know, uh, which seek to document and analyze the current set of affairs in ways that have not been 
possible both in, 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 in ways of observing and documenting the experience of pilgrimage. And I am also working on a documentary. The fir what I first proposed was to show the documentary, but Krishna told me, no, 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 that she'd rather have me give a talk. Uh, <laughs> so, so, but uh, what I would say to conclude is that understanding the importance and experience of pilgrimage traditions is of critical importance in West Africa but a deep understanding of the changing nature of pilgrimage in this region could also put us on the cutting edge of understanding the changing nature of one of the most important Islamic rituals and how this affects Islamic intellectual history on a global scale. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Usman, uh, Thank you, for uh, just uh, a wonderful talk uh, in its depth, in its richness, in the imagery, everything. Let me ask uh, two questions. Okay. Uh, you talk about how technology, geopolitics, everything has transformed pilgrimage. Uh, in terms of pilgrimage, getting there, the sacred site itself is important, but the process of getting there, genuine, is part of pilgrimage. People go to walk the Camino de Santiago, mm -hmm. and, and, and the process of walking and praying and meditating as you walk is as important as the sacred site when you get there. And, and so I'm thinking about all these changes. I know you mentioned in 1865, one fifth of pilgrims died in Mecca. But there's also a tradition about dying in Mecca and the implications of dying in Mecca. Mm -hmm. so, so my first question speaks to these changes that have occurred mm -hmm. uh, and what it needs or the implications for the understanding of pilgrimage mm -hmm. at a more textured mm -hmm. level. That is one question. Uh, the second one, uh, as we look at, you mentioned holy sites emerging in West Africa. As you travel in, in Muslim uh, areas in West Africa, you also see the renaming of regions you see Medinas, you, you see different places. It's almost as if West African Muslims are replicating the sacred topography of the Holy Lands back in West Africa. Now we have our own sites of pilgrimage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you foresee a time where going to Mecca might take secondary relevance to going to pilgrimage locally, or somehow these two will match together, or Mecca will always be the supreme pilgrimage one has to make. Okay, thank you for those uh, great questions, uh, Emmanuel. And uh, <coughs> so, remember that there are 1.8 billion Muslims, and no more than a couple of million uh, pilgrims every year now which means that only a tiny minority of the Muslim global population is, has been, is and has been involved in, in Hajj uh, historically. So therefore, necessarily, I think, uh, these uh, sites, you know, these uh, sites, and you, you are quite right that, you know, they give names to all, all those places, uh, you know, are, are important for the majority. I'm not saying that they are more important than the Hajj, uh, they, they won't say that for, for, for them, uh, but, but in reality, in, in, in reality, in fact, they know those sites and the majority of the people go in those sites. Only a tiny mi minority, you know, will go to, to Mecca, uh, et cetera. And for example, for, for the Murids, and I mentioned that, the, you know, the annual uh, celebration of uh, the return from exile of Ahmadou Bamba, the founder of the Muridism, you know, that there are two million people of Tuba and one million people who are coming, uh, three million people who celebrate that every year. And Ahmadou Bamba prayed, you know, that for those, let, you know, this pilgrimage, uh, you know, uh, let God accept this pilgrimage and give them the reward of 
those who couldn't, those, those who went to Mecca, you know. So which means that, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure other people also think thinks the same, that these local sites of pilgrimage are indeed very, very important, um, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thank I, you, Susan. I, um, struggling with a cold, so um, we'll speak more at a softer tone than I might. That was a really terrific talk uh, and um, uh, opened up uh, this important um, issue in, in really um, provocative ways for me. Uh, I too have two questions. The first is historical and the, pr and the second is present day. Um, there have been key sites such as Tad Mecca, um, which was around in the 13th century, literally. Where? where? Tad Mecca. Okay, okay, okay. Literally, Mecca stopped here, and I'm curious. I, we know of it in part through um, other industry there in this medieval period, but I'm wondering, um, it would imply by its name that um, it was also a local pilgrimage site, but I wanted your insights on that. Um, the second thing is a couple years back, I took a group of German uh, doctoral and postdoctoral students through Togo and Benin from the coast up country. And it, it was one of those uh, trips that absolutely floored me um, from the vantage point of architectural history. Uh, I have never seen so much uh, building of religious edifices, um, uh, most notably mosques, uh, some uh, towns with two and three uh, of them uh, recently built or under construction. It reminded me of medieval Europe and the, um, the momentum around the building of um, churches. And in one place, which was historically um, really neither Muslim nor Christian, um, with a, I mean, a large autochthonous population, this was in Savalu, north of Abomey in Benin. Um, I met, uh, we met with the ch uh, chief of the um, village who ha had uh, recently built a mosque um, adjacent to the palace and um, he had received funding to do so, and many of these mosques were being funded by Algerian, Saudi, and other, um, for lack of a better word, denominations. But uh, he had, uh, somebody had come to him asking him permission to build the mosque, and then following that up with paying for a trip for him uh, to Mecca. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering to what extent within this, the construction of mosques um, either an area, there's a huge one under construction in Port Novo, which has long had mosques, as you know, but I'm wondering how mosque construction um, is figuring into this uh, movement as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so let me, uh, you know, uh, first comment on your first question. Tad Mecca, this is a uh, tu Tuareg place, right? And, uh, and it has another name, by, uh, which I can't remember. Uh, anyway, but I, I, I didn't, uh, I have seen the name of the city several times, but never, you know, s see that there was a connection with Mecca. Maybe you can, you can tell me, you know, if you, uh, I didn't know. Now, on the issue of the building uh, of, um, of, of, of mosques, I think this was a part of the, you know, especially in non-Muslim areas, of the da'wah or, you know, uh, the attempt to spread Islam and uh, uh, Al-Qadhafi's, uh, you know, Qadhafi's, uh, his uh, organization da'wah also, you know, was very much uh, uh, involved in development and in all sorts of projects, in including in, 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 in building mosques. And it's true that, you know, the, uh, the World Muslim League in Saudi Arabia, which was, you know, uh, created by King Faisal of Saudi Arabia as a way of countering the influence of Abdel Nasser's pan-Arabism, you know, was very much committed to, to da'wah and to making uh, Saudi Arabia a leader in the Muslim world. And I know that they have uh, invested a lot in the building of mosques, uh, uh, etc. But there are also many uh, such mosques that are locally funded. And I think we should not uh, uh, exaggerate too much the impact of, uh, of, 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 uh, of these uh, donors from the uh, Arab world. Because there are many communities that are self-funded, you know, and, uh, and um, 
and and uh, well now I don't see uh, the, the clear connection between what I have presented and the rele and, and these new mosques. Could you uh, tell me your question again? Um, one, one, it has to do with questions of conversion in part, but I think it also has to do with the importance of the Hajj as part of a larger process of um, bringing together the leaders of a community into the broader um, Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. for, for lack of a better word. And I, when I saw this, as I said, I was reflecting on precedents, uh, particularly in the Christian world, but I'm also wondering whether there were similar kinds of things that were happening, uh, let's say, in the period that you have so brilliantly written about in Mali in the 14th century, et cetera, where certainly some of this, m these monies, Mons Mus himself purportedly had made some, uh, had, had built some 50 mosques. I think that's probably an exaggeration, but there is that out there. But I'm wondering to what extent the construction of mosques um, uh, is is engaged with the larger issue of pilgrimage in its promotion and in the larger issues at play. Okay, the the, the one uh, connection I see is, you know, with the modern pilgrimage is that since it was taken over by the Saudi and because they had money and because they wanted to uh, to support some groups. And uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, people who, uh, you know, who were close to them and who were, you know, well connected to them, they may or may not have been Wahhabi, you know, were able to uh, get resources there in order to, you know, to, to create Islamic institutions that include mosques, that include schools and, 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 and all that. So it was not just the uh, modern pilgrimage, but the fact that the state which organized it invested a lot in you know in 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 in, in, in you know sp spreading islam expanding islam and and you know and also which means also that their influence will grow in in in, in all these areas and definitely you know uh, you know the building of mosques also would be part of that uh, you know effort <coughs> usman <coughs> i've often been curious about the relationship on the way to Mecca mm -hmm. between the converted and the unconverted. I mean, how do you get from Mali to Medina, right? I mean, do you walk across the desert? Do you go through Lagos? <laughs> you know, what, what, is the, the, what are the routes? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, take a, uh, it took such a long time, mm -hmm. right? So there had to be interaction between Muslims and non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. In, on the African continent. Mm -hmm. And I'm very curious about that. Mm -hmm. um, so c could you explain? Okay. Uh, I mean, when Mansa Musa is taking all those elephants and all that gold, how does he go? I, I thought that you, you produced a documentary. I did, I did. <laughs> but but I, didn't, I didn't do the DNA analysis of who slept with whom along the way, because I'm very interested in that in migration means the migration of genes, right. as well as ideas in religion. It was impossible for them not to interact with non-Muslim Africans, and I'm very curious mm -hmm. about all levels of contact. <laughs> mm -hmm. Me too, I found that you know, very interesting, although I still don't understand quite well that, that process. I know that you know uh, many people. In the, 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 there are a few studies about you know people who are going to the pilgrimage and who never go back home and never reach the pilgrimage sites. You know because uh, they settled in in Sudan or in works. Uh, you know pilgrim in the strange land or by works about how to be settled in uh, you know in other parts of West Africa or Yamba and also permanent pilgrims. So I know that uh, since it was long, it was, a, you know, uh, it was a project for them that was never uh, realized, in, you know, and uh, so there are, uh, you know, uh, issues that need to be, you know, uh, maybe better, better studied and fully understand, but I, I take uh, this question seriously, you know. Um, 
Yeah, and, and, and of course, but I said also that in the, in the Holy Land, some people went there and, and never came back. And even in the beginning of the 20th century, the French you know, wrote to complain that you know, there were French citizens who, were, who, who didn't uh, come back because they, were, they might have been um, kidnapped you know, there. So yeah, so, so interaction between Muslims and uh, non-Muslims along the way and what happened in the process for, especially when people were going, I mean, I was in, I was in Jerusalem just last month and uh, I visited there a neighborhood close to the Asqa, uh, Asqa, um, uh, Aqsa Mosque of Africans who have been, West Africans who have been, you know, who have lived there for generations. And, <laughs> and, and they told me that, you know, their parents came for, uh, you know, they, they were there, you know, as part of the, you know, search for knowledge and pilgrimage because they didn't just go to, to Mecca and Medina, but they also go to, uh, you know, in places, and I was uh, talking to Jenny, and she mentioned the, uh, the, the pilgrimage in Hebron. And when I went to Hebron, I found that there were many Africans who were coming to, to perform the pilgrimage, the, the, you know, in the sh shrine of Abraham and, 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 and their children. And there is also something called the Maqam Musa in, 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 in uh, Jericho, and, uh, and of course in, in Jerusalem. So Africans also have been part of that pilgrimage tradition, and there are their descendants who are still there. And I met some of them, and they, 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 they intermarried with the Arab, uh, other Arab Muslims and never went back home. Uh -huh. so, so this is also another tradition. And of course, there are African, uh, the Falasha Jews who have been also there. This is not something that I studied. And the Christian Africans <laughs> who now have started a new, uh, you know, tradition of pilgrimage because, you know, African states sponsored the Muslim pilgrimage. They said that, okay, we two Christians, we have our sites of pilgrimage. Well, and Ethiopians have been making that pilgrimage. And Nigerians, many. Or, and they, they are called JP, Jerusalem Pilgrimage. Right. So they are all but Ethiopians have been going since the late Middle Ages. Right, but th these are uh, Jews or uh, no, the Christians. Christians. Oh, Christian, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe so Jews too. I don't know, but the Christians definitely. But now there are uh, many, many uh, Christian pilgrimage. I don't know. You want to comment on that, Emmanuel? Do you know about that Christian of JP? JP. Uh, Christian pilgrimages to Jerusalem mm -hmm. have become very sort of established. It's almost, uh, it's not become like a requirement like the Hajj, if you can make it in your lifetime. But the, the surprise when people find out that I haven't gone to Jerusalem tells me that it's becoming an expectation if you can afford to do that. Mm -hmm. But for those who have gone, one of the important things they bring back uh, bottles of water from the River Jordan, which increasingly we put little drops in water for baptism. Mm -hmm. So even though I haven't gone, I've been given bottles from the Jordan. Uh, so one of these days, I guess I have to make that pilgrimage myself. Mm -hmm. So it's become very, very popular right. uh, among whole churches, organized pilgrimages to Jerusalem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Professor Khan, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, um, do you believe there's a relationship between the changes in the, in the pilgrimage and the rise of fundamental Islam um, over the past couple of years? Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, uh, what do you account for the emergence of these alternative sites in West and in North Africa? Mm -hmm. Does it have to do with um, a larger process of uh, Africans building institutions for Africans? Does it have to do with um, larger cleavages between Gulf countries and African countries and, and, and Islam. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was hoping you could maybe shed some light on that. Thank you. Okay, the first question, I think many, uh, you know, uh, there is a literature, you know, documenting the connection between pilgrimage and reform. Like people who went there, stay there, study there, then, you know, learn and go back home with the project you know, of reforming religion because they, they feel that the way that it is practiced you know, uh, uh, in, 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 ho in, their ho in their home countries that, you know, that was not uh, a pure Islam, etc. And remember, those sites were also 
uh, you know, uh, places of encounter where Muslims from different parts of the world came. They were not sites of pilgrimage only, but also, they, uh, you know, uh, schools in, in the sense that people would study there. They would study hadith and, and all that, and they go back home and, you know, feel dissatisfied with how Islam is practiced there. So, be it the Tablighi Jama'at, whose founder, you know, uh, you know, returned to Mecca, from Mecca and, you know, with the project, or other, ma many groups, you know, there is this, uh, con uh, you know, connection that many uh, reform movement, the al Moravid movement, which was one of the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, powerful movement of reform in, in West Africa, in, 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 you know, West and North Africa, you know, its founder, Abdullah bin Yasin went back from Mecca and, and then came with a new vision and then started that. And also in West Africa, many of those called Wahhabi, you know, they went to, uh, these were rich merchants for the most part, some went to Mecca and came back home and that's where they embraced Wahhabism. But this doesn't mean that, you know, we are, they were all, uh, West Africans are, are only recipients of Wahhabism. As I explained, at the moment of the, you know, foundation of the, 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 of the uh, Saudi kingdom, they were very much involved in teaching and, 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 and preaching. So the, the second question was what exactly? West Africa and, and Northern Africa, whether you think it's at all tied to a larger process of African development or, or African for African institutions or yeah, is yeah, okay, yeah, splits yeah. between African and Gulf states mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on Islam and so mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, David Robinson, you know, explained that the process of uh, uh, Islamization in Africa, sh you know, has two components, Islamization of Africa and Africanization of Islam, you know, in the sense that, you know, some uh, 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 if is Islamization of Africa is that something that can be recognized as Islam could be seen in Africa. But Africanization of Islam is how the people, um, the appropriate institutions and practices, uh, you know. And, uh, and, and obviously, because the majority of the people can't go, there are intermediaries, you know, scholars or saints, etc., who, uh, you know, were for the people the, the most tangible, uh, you know, uh, manifestation of what they are looking for in terms of spirituality. So necessarily this will, you know, this I think produce these local, uh, you know, traditions of pilgrimage. And there are so many of them. If you go to Senegal every day almost, there is a, you know, celebration of some festival of some saints or, 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 or yeah, I think that this is part of, uh, you know, the Africanization of Islam that, you know, we, uh, adopt some institutions, but give them, you know, a local meaning. Hi, thank you for this excellent presentation. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the dynamics of gender. You mentioned earlier that there has been a shift in terms of the amount of women um, who, who are making the pilgrimage. Can you talk about those trends? Uh, and also, could you talk a bit about the sources you're working with? You mentioned the unpublished travelogues, which um, is exciting. I would love to hear more about the kinds of other sources that you're using as you develop this project. Okay, thank you very much. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, participation, you know, as I said, uh, it was uh, very much uh, gendered up until the, 15th, uh, the, uh, the 1950s. And I think this might, I, I, I assume, uh, the, the, my, my hypothesis is that uh, insecurity was a problem, you know, because it was quite uh, unsafe for everybody. And, uh, and even some people before, uh, males before going, uh, you know, they would, uh, you know, maybe give their, say their wills to their family before leaving because they, they, did, they, accept, they didn't accept that they would come back. So I don't think that in, in, it was thinkable in that context that they will include women. Now, after the, security, the insecurity was eradicated, and also I think women joining the labor force and having more resources and being also involved in trade, in business, especially 
I explained that it was linked to, to trade and, 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 and many, uh, you know, there are increasingly, you know, uh, huge population of women entrepreneurs who, you know, uh, you know, travel to those countries, to Dubai, to, to, to China, etc. And so they are involved, you know, in, 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 in trade and, and the pilgrimage, you know, is, you know, combined with other, other business, you know, activities. So I think uh, that th these are the, the explanation. And sometimes even women outnumber men, um, uh, and this is uh, so extraordinary that in few decades from zero women, and we have the colonial records that, that there were no women um, among the pilgrims, you know, traveling at least by boat. Two women outnumbering male. That's, uh, I think this is what I think. Le one is that, you know, insecurity, security situation improve. And the second is that the more and more women joining the labor force and uh, having the resources to, to, to do their own uh, pilgrimage. Thank you for, for this wonderful paper. I also had a question. I was captivated by your reference to the different kinds of artifacts um, and goods that circulate um, uh, along um, uh, trajectories of the pilgrimage. And you mentioned, for example, um, uh, uh, clothes and fabrics and uh, holy water and so on. So I was wondering, at, in the homes of pilgrims, how these objects um, um, acquire meaning? Do they become this kind of inalienable possessions, this kind of prestige goods? And if with the separation of uh, regional pilgrimage from the Hajj, there emerges also a hierarchy between the objects that are being acquired um, in different sites of, of, of pilgrimage, mm -hmm. and perhaps even their, their monetary value. Mm -hmm. Although those objects, because you know, there, was, there is a demand, you know, are now available in most of these countries. <laughs> Zem -zem, in principle, you can buy in Dakar, in Conakry, elsewhere, you know. These clothes, you know, uh, most of the clothes are buyer and clothes from the Holy Lands. Also, you know, Chinese merchants and other people who are going to Beijing, they will, they will bring it. So whatever you, you, you need, you know, uh, you, you know, you, know you, can, you can get also locally, but still there is a kind of um, fascination or for, for these uh, artifacts. And also, you know, when people perform the pilgrimage, they, wanna, they want this to be visible in their appearance in terms of you know, uh, wearing a kind of hat like, like, like mine. So now, uh, in some countries, they will call me Al-Hajj because of the <laughs> and, and, and this is, by the way, not, uh, not Saudi. This is a Nigerian, so, which means that this is an example of, uh, of uh, you know, appropriation of them. Yeah, so, so I think uh, these artifacts have uh, value and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and they are valued by the, by the pilgrims. Uh, and for this reason, you know, anything that may be of value and that, you know, would be produced by the Chinese in huge and affordable quantities and be distributed, you know, not, you, don't not, you don't even need to go anymore to the, to the Holy Land. But people who want to, you know, give the appearance that they are part of this, you know, Islamic global cosmopolitan uh, you know, may, may want to buy, buy those and, you know, they can get, it, get them locally also. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Sir.